Would you take your Bibles with me and open to Ephesians chapter 4? Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians 4, 25 through 5, 2, first couple verses of chapter 5, that's where we're going to conclude. That's our text this morning as we continue our way uh, through the book of Ephesians. And if you're using one of the Red Bibles, Ephesians 4, 25 will be found on page 978. And I want to ask you one more time, if you're able, if you would stand, so that we might honor the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25 through chapter 5, verse 2. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Would you remain standing as we pray once more? Father, would you help us now to be changed by your word? Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Open our hearts to receive it. Father, these commands in this text are in some ways, clear and straightforward, perhaps in some ways easy to understand. But we acknowledge they're hard to live out, and we want to. So would today just mark a day, even in the life of our church, may today mark a day when these things are put aside, and we pursue that which builds up this body. Would you do this for our good and for your glory? We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. On this very date, 23 years ago, I concluded the sermon that day, part of the application of the text I preached. I walked around front and stood behind a table where we had a stack of church covenants. And I called out individuals that day, about 60 names. I called them out one by one, and they would get out of their seat and walk to the front and sign a copy of the church covenant. It was a day in which we were somewhat reconstituting our membership. Already, we had become a church through some odd situations, really like most other Southern Baptist churches. The average Southern Baptist church, the last time I was given the statistic, The average Southern Baptist Church has 290 church members and 70 people in attendance on a Sunday morning. And I knew we didn't want to be that. We wanted membership to be meaningful. We wanted to walk together and live together in a meaningful way. And so we decided to do really what churches had done consistently all the way up until about the middle of the 20th century to take a church covenant and have our members sign it. It would be a declaration that uh, we wanted to commit ourselves to the Lord and obedience to His Word and to one another to walk faithfully together. The covenant we signed that day, October 29th of 2000, is the same covenant all of our members still sign today. In that covenant, we declare things like, we will work and pray for unity among the members of this body. We will rejoice at one another's happiness and by tenderness and sympathy bear one another's burdens and sorrows. We'll walk together in brotherly love, exercise affectionate care 
for one another. Again, just a, a powerful reminder of what it means to be a member of a local church and the commitment that is required to walk well together. We wanted to be the kind of church that, instead of tearing each other apart, grows together in love. And we knew that was going to require a commitment of us to walk in a certain way. But long before we or any other church drafted together a church covenant like this and had our members sign it, Paul, the apostle, was already thinking to this end. That's why he writes Ephesians 4, 25 through 5, 2. It's not by mistake that Ephesians 4, 25 through 5, 2 comes after Paul's description at the beginning in chapter 4 of his vision of the glorious church that Jesus Christ has formed. We know from, from Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, it is a glorious picture. It is, it's just majestic. It is awe-inspiring to think that, that, that the Lord Jesus Christ would just take individuals to himself and gift them and grace them and, and then give them back to one another so that together, each different giftedly, they could walk in an interdependent way and grow in love. That's a beautiful picture. And yet we also all know that that can go terribly wrong. We could probably spend the rest of the afternoon just telling stories about churches that have divided, churches that have been self-destructive. Members' meetings have come to be notorious for the kind of places you do not want to be. And you'll see all kinds of wickedness and terrible actions from professing believers. Simply bringing the church together as a redeemed people, it's not guaranteed that it all comes up lilies and roses all the time. It requires us to walk and live in a certain way. And what Paul does for us in Ephesians 4, 25 through 5, 2, is he outlines in detail what is required of us, how we must live if we're going to live well together and indeed contribute to one another's growth and holiness instead of tearing one another down. The way that this specific text relates to the one we saw last week as we looked at Ephesians 4, 17 through 24 is Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, I think outlines in a general way the pursuit of holiness. You put off the old man who you were once ruled by sin. You put away those actions. You renew the spirit of your mind. You, you renew your mind to what God says we are to do and why we are to do it. And then you put on the new man. You put on, you pursue the practices of holiness and obedience to Christ. But if you were left last week saying, well, then, Paul, you've told us generally what pursuing holiness looks like, but how would that be fleshed out in detail? What things do we need to be putting off? And what things specifically do we need to be putting on? That's what Ephesians 4, 25 through 5, 2 answers. Now, in some way, I can't quite figure it out. This is either a really easy text to outline, or it's nearly an impossible text to outline. And here's what I mean. Paul just abruptly lists command after command after command. It's hard. I went to sit around with the interns this week saying, is there an easy way that we can outline this in a couple of points? And I couldn't figure it out. And maybe that's Paul's point. Maybe Paul would say to me, if he were standing here, quit trying to do something fancy and just tell them the commands. So that's what I'm going to do. Consequently, there's going to be five sermon points this morning. <laughs> but I won't dilly-dally, right? Five sermon points, we'll walk through them. I'm just going to tell you what Paul commands in this text. Number one. Oh, let me say this as well. I, I don't think I'm any expert at, at smooth transitions from point to point anyway. I mean, oftentimes, you probably feel like, well, that was a bit abrupt. This morning, you're going to really feel like that. It's because I just want to mirror how abrupt Paul is. He just moves from one to the other. So number one, instead of speaking dishonestly to one another, speak truthfully. That's the first command he gives us. Instead of speaking dishonestly to one another, speak truthfully. This is where Paul begins in verse 25. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Now, let me first of all just make one thing clear. You might think, especially by the use of the word neighbor, that Paul is talking about how we work and live out in the world, just with unbelievers, because 
Oftentimes, the word neighbor, as Jesus taught us, neighbor could apply to anyone in need. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan. Who is my neighbor? What happened to be someone that, that, that he wouldn't relate to normally, but someone in need. So we might say the neighbor is anyone in need. So Jesus is telling us, um, you know, no longer speak falsehood, but speak truthfully with your neighbor, with the unbelieving world. And though I'm not recommending we lie to the unbeliever, I don't think his context he's thinking about is the unbelieving world. And the reason is because after saying neighbor, he clarifies at the end of verse 25 saying, for we are members one of another. That is not the way Paul speaks of a believer and an unbeliever. It's how he speaks of the church. We are members of one another. Therefore, you and I need to, as a church, if we're going to work well together and make sure that we grow together instead of tearing each other down and tearing each other apart, we need to make sure, one, that we're just not lying to one another, but instead that we're speaking truthfully. If the church is going to function in a way that honors Christ and it's going to function in a way that each of us grows in holiness, then we need to create a community of trust. I remember... When I was younger, maybe third grade, um, I, I grew up in public school uh, in, in Kentucky, and I had, that, that's why I'm so poorly educated, as it um, comes out, I'm sure, often. Um, but I had a friend, well, a so-called friend, named uh, Stephen. And I remember Stephen, we got together, and his conversation, even as a, a nine or ten-year-old, was what a lot of public school kids were thinking about and talking about in uh, the early 80s in Kentucky, which was... Um, who are you interested in? And so Stephen said, who are you interested in? Who do you like? And I don't know that I had anybody specifically in mind, but I remember answering his question. And honestly, I was trying to jog my memory this morning. I can't remember if I said Stacy or Lacey, which is funny. It's not that I'm stumbling over how, what, what I said, that I mispronounced it or something. It's that there was literally, there was a girl named Stacy and a girl named Lacey. I can't remember which one I answered, but I answered one of them. And um, again, I don't, I don't know how interested I was, but I, I said that. But I do remember what happened the next day. After telling Stephen, Stacy or Lacey, I said this, which is what every 10-year-old boy worried about his reputation would say, but don't tell anyone. <laughs> and I remember the next day having like five or six people come up to me and go, oh, I hear that you like Stacy or Lacey or whoever it is that I said. And this was the day, like texting didn't exist then. There was no group texting. Stephen was just impressive. <laughs> I mean, he had made his way around, right? It was really good. Well done, Stephen, you know? And uh, he had just told so many people. And I remember even as a kid that, that day, something settling in my heart that said this. Um, you probably can't really have close friends in whom you share secrets because this is what happens. And praise the Lord, by His grace, He brought a friend named Jeremy just a year later into my life, and uh, I decided I'm going to give it another try, and I told Jeremy, hey, you know, here's some secret or whatever, um, and he kept the secret. He was trustworthy, and it changed my life. And all of a sudden began thinking, man, one of the greatest things in the world is pulling together people in your life whom you can trust. When you have that, it's a glorious thing. Well, that's what Jesus Christ longs for his church to be, a people who are brought together who know we can trust one another because we do not speak falsehood. We speak truthfully. We speak honestly. We understand that we are members of one another. And so if I'm not speaking truthfully to you, but instead of speaking falsely to you, it's like doing something to harm myself. We're members of one body. And so that's the first just easy, straightforward command Paul gives us in the text. And instead of speaking dishonestly to one another, speak truthfully. Now, abruptly, second point. Number two, don't sin in your anger and make sure it's short-lived. Don't sin in your anger and make sure it's short-lived. In verses 26 and 27, Paul writes, Be angry and do not sin. 
Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, one thing I'll admit that can be confusing about verse 26, because Paul starts that verse saying, be angry, and if you'll go down to verse 31, you'll note that he says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger, and clamor and slander, be put away from you. So how do we reconcile verse 26, where Paul begins, be angry and do not sin, and verse 31, where Paul says, put away all anger? So are we allowed to be angry? Are we not allowed to be angry? How how, how does this work? Well, some have reconciled it. I think there's basically two approaches, and and, and maybe either one of these would work. I I think I'm going to go with the latter. But one way that you can approach this is by saying this. There is never an excuse for a believer to be angry. That's what Paul's making clear in verse 31. And so what's happening in verse 26 is Paul is speaking in terms of a concession. Right? He's saying, don't get angry, verse 31, but if you do find yourself angry, let me show you how to navigate that without sinning. That may well be what Paul's doing. But I think he may be doing, and this is his second option, it may be that he's noting there are two different ways that we can be angry. One, we can be sinfully angry. That's when we're angry, and our anger is based on our own selfishness, our own pride. And, and when your anger is stemming from that, it is unrighteous anger. But there's also a category in which you could be righteously angry. So if we found out today someone whom we love, maybe a brother in Christ, decided to leave his wife and child, and we go, man, that makes me angry. I think the Bible would say that, that's righteous anger. That's fair. You know, there's some things that are worth feeling angry about. And that's what he's talking about in verse 26. I tend to think that the latter is the case. But I also want to say, even as I create a category for righteous anger, a lot of times the anger we feel that we think is righteous is really not that righteous. We are easily deceived. But the other thing I want to say is, even if you are righteously angry about something, your righteous anger has an expiration date on it. Isn't that the way Paul speaks in verse 26? He says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, when he says, do not let the sun go down on your anger, I I don't know that he means we are about to fall back and the winter, the days are shorter. So I don't know that he's going to say, if you get angry at 4.30 p.m., you have to make sure by 4.45 when the sun goes down, sadly, in the wintertime, you better stop being angry. I don't know that he means it in a literal way, but he is saying this, don't let it linger. Don't let it linger. You've probably had this experience before where you have a gallon of milk and it has printed on it an expiration date. And I remember when I was a kid, the first thing that happened to me, I put that milk in cereal. And I was all excited about whatever it was, you know, Lucky Charms or Frankenberry or whatever. I wasn't like a model of, of health. And I remember being excited and diving into that cereal and taking my first bite and thinking, good grief, what have I put in my mouth? That's the worst thing in the world. And it's because the milk had expired. It's amazing how milk can be like good, 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 terrible. (laughs) There's no like gradual. Ah, It it tastes like it's kind of getting bad. It's just immediately terrible. And... um, and, and after that experience, I remember just thinking my whole life, any time we were, if the expiration date was there, you just toss that thing. It's not worth the risk. And then Lily uh, told me, it doesn't always go bad on that exact date. And so now we smell it. It's like a game of Russian roulette in my house now <laughs> with the milk. But, but anger's the same way. Um, it can feel just righteous, 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 terrible, rancid and destroy your soul. And Paul says, when we let anger linger, we open the door for the devil. He sees it as an opportunity to exploit our anger. And have you ever met anyone? No doubt you have. Maybe, maybe, maybe an older man, and you just think to yourself, he's just angry all the time. Well, how do we get there? 
we get there by letting even righteous anger linger. And when it does, the devil seizes the opportunity and turns you into a bitter person. And and the great risk for us, I think, is that we live in a culture where you have plenty of reasons even to feel righteous anger. We live in a culture where where they kill babies, where uh, children are being given uh, puberty blockers that that have uh, long-term consequences in their life, right? Uh, Just looking at social media will give you reason to be angry. Watching the news will give you reason to be angry. Thinking about the decisions that your government makes will make you feel angry. And yet every time you feel angry, you are playing with a ticking time bomb. And so what we must do in those moments when we feel righteous anger is we need to pray. We need to pray. Now, now praying will do two things. One, if you feel righteous anger over something you can do nothing about, praying allows you to take the step of asking the Lord to do something about it. I mean, Jesus will teach us in the text... uh, Vengeance is mine, declares the Lord, right? You, you hear of, you know, children being hostage in another country. There's nothing you can do about it. Well, you pray because God is our just God. And even if he doesn't do anything in this life, the books will be balanced in the end. But another reason we should pray is because the Lord is often pleased to move in response to our prayers as we live in this life, right? He... Um, is pleased to use our prayers as the means whereby he brings about his justice in the world. And so pray. In fact, what if all the time believers spend expressing to one another how angry we are about situations? Oh, did you hear what so-and-so said? Oh, did you see this on social media? What if every time we felt angry about those things, we used it as an opportunity to pray. Good grief, we would pray a lot, wouldn't we? That would be good. So allow this anger, instead of lingering in your life, allow it to channel you toward prayer, asking the Lord to do that which would honor Him. Lord, may it be done on earth as Your will is perfectly done in heaven. Be angry, Paul says, and do not sin. Don't sin in your anger and make sure it's short-lived. Number three, don't steal, but work. That should say hard. Work hard, not had. Uh, Don't steal, but work hard so that you can give. Don't steal, but work hard so that you can give. Verse 28 Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. The first half of this verse, I think it's honest and easy, let the thief no longer steal. I doubt anyone is thinking, oh, I had a really pro-stealing argument I was ready to make, right? I, I think it's clear and straightforward and easy, do not steal. But the rest of it perhaps could be challenging. So let me clear some things up here. First of all, in verse 28, when he says, rather let him labor doing honest work with his own hands, Paul isn't recognizing that the only kind of honest work we can do is manual labor. That is a good way to work. That's a fine and acceptable way to work. If you you earn your living by doing manual labor, that's a good thing. But I don't think Paul is strictly saying that's the only way you can work. You could work by being a consultant which may mean you're on the phone or you're, you're you know, FaceTiming over a computer or something like this, right? So Paul's not saying uh, manual labor is only work. By honest work, he's just saying earn a living in an honest way. Don't, don't try to steal from people. Work and work so that you can earn a wage. This also, I think, highlights for us that work itself isn't part of the fall. It's part of God's good design. Now, yes, because of the fall, the earth is cursed. And so sometimes we'll work and we'll feel like the earth is fighting against us. You try to get your grass in nice shape and you're fighting against weeds. And, and sometimes weeds grow in an area and, and you want grass to grow in this area and it won't. And it feels like, oh, I'm working and working and it's hard and hard. Well, that's part of the fall. That work can be so strenuous and feels like it's fighting against you. But the idea of work itself is God's design. It's a good thing. Believers should be known as hard workers. 
But also interesting is the reason he gives for working. He doesn't say, work, so that you might provide for yourself. Now certainly, that's a necessary element. Paul will say some strong things about the individual who is unwilling to provide for his family. So we do work to provide for ourselves. So think of it this way. As a believer, working to provide for myself is necessary. But as a believer, working to provide for myself only is not sufficient. As a believer, Paul says, work so that you might have something to share with those in need. One of the reasons you and I work throughout the week is, yes, so that we can provide for our family, but another reason we work throughout the week is so that we might have something to give, so that we might bless others, so that we might meet the, meet the needs of others who indeed have needs. As a church, we have an account called Storehouse, a, a part of our budget labeled Storehouse. That part of the budget is set aside to provide for any member of our church in need. We do not want any members of our church to be in need. Well, how do we have that money? How, how can we meet the needs of members of our church? Because other members of our church work hard and give in order that that member have, who has need may be provided for. In fact, all of us do that. It may be that you're working and giving today and your need arises tomorrow, in which case the church can bless you and benefit you. I remember when we had COVID and individuals, some of them were, were, were not able to work. There was a time when we sat back as pastors saying, we want to make sure that everybody is provided for during this time. And I remember many of you, just above and beyond your regular sacrificial giving to the church, came and said, if there is any member of the church who has need, I want to know because I want to provide for them. Brothers, that's the spirit that Paul is pointing us toward here. So as believers, not only are we speaking truthfully and trustworthy to one another, not only are we in our anger not sinning, but also we're working hard in order that we may give, that we may provide for one another. And this then brings us to point number four. Instead of using corrupting speech, speak only that which builds up others. Instead of using corrupting speech, speak only that which builds up others. When I was young, I've shared this before, and I, I do share it to my shame, uh, genuinely so. Again, I mentioned public school, Kentucky, right? Um, embarrassingly so, uh, from the time I was nine years old until the time I met my friend Jeremy, uh, when I was about 11 years old, I cursed like a sailor. It's, it's, it's really embarrassing. It was utterly, if nothing else, utterly dishonoring to my parents. And uh, until, I'll say just a quick thing, I, I said I met that friend Jeremy that changed my life. Not only was he trustworthy, but, but I cursed so much that I remember the day that I met Jeremy, I got to the end of the day and I said to him, you've, you've not said a cuss word all day long. As if that was impressive. It was to me, you know. In 1986 or whatever it was, that was, wow, well done, you know. And uh, I remember his response was, that's right, because I'm a Christian. Which is one of the more convicting things I heard in my life and changed my life. Because I said, well, I'm a Christian too. Therefore, I want to start honoring Christ. And um, I remember the verse I memorized was the first part of Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupt, I memorized it this way, let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth, or as Paul says here in verse uh, 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Now I'll say, as much as it was helpful for me as a 9 and 10 year old to memorize that verse in order not to dishonor my parents through cursing, that's a very shallow way to think about this text. This text is about much more than that. Note, when Paul says, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, he contrasts it with another way of speaking. He says, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion so that it may give grace to those who hear. In other words, Paul says, if you want to know what I mean by corrupting speech coming out of your mouth, I mean anything that's the opposite of speech that builds up others. Anything that might tear them down, anything that might speak ill of our brother and sister in Christ. 
And I know this is hard to do. Among all the things that I've said today, this may be the most challenging. I know the temptation when you have a negative encounter with someone. So you run into someone and they say something that's very hurtful to you or or rude or disrespectful or something like this. It's very tempting for you to go to the very next person you talk to, whether it's your wife or husband when you go home or, or a friend you see on the street and go, man, let me tell you what so and so just said. And then when you relay that, what you're doing is you're communicating about that person that they are evil. You're suggesting evil of them. You're painting them in a bad light. You're definitely communicating they're not as good as I am. Right? You are tearing them down. And I think verse 30 is tied in with that. When Paul says, and do not grieve the Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. I think that, that this is basically a positive way of saying what he says negatively. Giving opportunity to the devil when we let our anger linger, linger. Well, when we speak that which tears down and does not build up, it grieves the Holy Spirit. Why? Because of the very thing that Tom prayed just a few minutes ago. Christ loves his church. And when believers speak in ways that tear down members of the body of Christ, it grieves the Holy Spirit. So how about, and I know this is lofty, but by the power of the Spirit of God, we can do it. We are no longer enslaved to sin, we're slaves of righteousness. How about, as members of Cornerstone, we make this commitment, we will not speak ill of our brothers and sisters in Christ. We will not speak in such a way that tears them down, in such a way that suggests evil of them, in such a way that exalts us above them. That is not too much to ask. In fact, that's what Jesus commands. And if the Great Commission is that we are to teach one another how to obey all that Christ commands, it includes this command right here. You and I, need to make our commitment. And one thing I think that will make this easier is we're doing it together. So what that means is when you're with another brother or sister in Christ and you start speaking evil, that person should all of a sudden begin to get very uncomfortable and awkward, right? Oh, good grief. And that should be signaling to you, oh yeah, I'm speaking evil, my brother and sister in Christ. And if their awkward reaction that feels very sheepish If that's not communicating, then that person that's feeling very sheepish is just say, you know what, let's just not talk that way. Let's just not do that. But let's not stop there. So on the one hand, let's stop, put away, put off, speaking ill of one another, suggesting evil of one another, speaking in such a way that builds us up and put others down. Let's let's put that to the side, knowing that that grieves the Spirit of God. Now, this doesn't mean... That we can't deal with one another's sin, but you deal with one another's sin face to face, don't you? I don't see Tom do sin and go, hey, let me tell you what Tom did. Well, let's pray for him, right? That, that's, how we, that, that's how we cover gossip, right? I'm not gossiping. It's a prayer request about how evil Tom is, right? No, 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 of course not, right? You confront your brother or sister of Christ to their face. Now, if they won't repent, you go get two witnesses, but then only then to go confront them to their face, So let's make a commitment. On the one hand, we'll not speak ill of each other. But on the other hand, let's do something positive. Paul doesn't stop at what not to do, right? Verse 29, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. But, now he's going to tell us positive. Only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Paul says, I want you to speak in such a way that you're constantly building up other people, that you're giving them grace that they are being built up and edified in the Lord. Good grief, how could that change us? I mean, just imagine if our conversation, both to one another and behind one another's backs, was about the evident grace of God we see in one another. Let me tell you how impressive Tom is, right? That all of a sudden is an amazing way. I want as cornerstoners, when we come up to somebody and they go, hey, I was just talking about you, I want us to be eager not bashful about hearing what they had to say, because we trust it was good. Let's point out grace in one of those lives, and let's think of other texts. The Bible tells us we should outdo one another in showing honor. Outdo one another. Jesus says, you like competition? Here's one. Outdo one another in honoring one another. 
Let that be it. Make it a challenge. That's fine. Jesus is not worried that you will do this too much. In fact, it's funny sometimes how we do this. Sometimes we are holier. We pursue holiness, we think, at a level above what Jesus gives. So we say something like this. I want to encourage you, but I want to make sure you don't become arrogant. I think we're more worried about that than Jesus is. I have yet to see that qualification in the Bible. He doesn't say, outdo one another in showing honor, but make sure you insult them on the side, lest they get too honored. You don't want them puffed up, right? Man, that sermon is very helpful today, but you are awkward and thin. <laughs> right? Like, that's just, we just don't, we don't, I know, I think all of that comes from a good desire, right? Because we know we know individuals who are arrogant and have destroyed the faith, and we think, I don't want to be means to that. Well, brother, let's just, leave, let's just leave that to the Lord. I don't think Jesus will rebuke us if we say, when I speak, I want to be lavish in grace. If I speak, I want to build up. If I speak, I want to be showing honor and trying to outdo everybody else in doing that. In fact, it seems, Jesus says, do that and watch how I will build my church. So, can you imagine how glorious it will be if we become a community who will not only not speak ill of others, behind their backs, gossip and do all this, but will actually speak in such a way that we're constantly trying to build up, show grace and honor. That's not super Christianity. That's just the Bible. Which brings us to our last point, number five, which is really a summation, I think. In verse 31, he gives a, a negative summation. Let all bitter, oh, I'm sorry, let me give you the point. Number five, the point. Put away all bitterness and be kind, forgiving, and loving. Now, I've, I've summed up these verses, which are a summation of the rest of the text. I summed up this itself. Put away all bitterness. There's going to be much more there. But put away all bitterness and be kind, forgiving, and loving. So let's look at the first summation negatively. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away along with all malice. So obviously when he said, let, let no corrupt speech come out of your mouth, he, he included uh, speech that would be bitter, speech that would be slanderous, right? So, so he's, he's, he's mentioning all these things again because they're a summation. When you let anger linger past its expiration date, it becomes bitterness and wrath and, and sinful anger, um, right, so on and so forth. So, so, so Paul's saying, I just, just put all that away. Anything that would, that would tempt you to, to tear down, anything that would, you know, make others be hindered in their obedience to Christ, just put all of that away. Become a sweet-spirited person. He actually says it positively in verse 32, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. Now, the thing I want to note here is that when Paul says, be kind and tender-hearted and forgiving, sometimes I think we can think of kindness and tender-heartedness as personality traits. Well, that's a kind, tender-hearted person. I'm not so much that way, personality-wise. If we think that, then I think we're thinking wrong. Kindness and tender-heartedness aren't unique personality traits. These are fruits of the Spirit, right? kindness, gentleness. That's a fruit of the Spirit. In other words, if you had met Jesus walking around, you would have said, he's kind and tenderhearted. Well, let's be like him. So, toward one another, instead of being bitter and angry and, and slanderous and, and bring all kinds of evil intent to what we do for, to one another, Paul says, be kind to one another, be tenderhearted, be, be quick to forgive one another. Why? Because God in Christ forgave you. He then sums it up, continue, continues to sum it up in verses, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, be imitators of God. When you're kind to one another, when you're tenderhearted to one another, when you forgive one another, you're imitating God because what has He been to us? Kind. Tender. He's dealt with us gently. He's forgiven us. Did we deserve it? No. Will your brother or sister in Christ always deserve it? No. But be kind and tenderhearted and forgiving. He says, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. 
our response to one another should be one of loving. Now, there are two things that I want to say at the end of all of these commands. Maybe three things. One, and I don't have these on the slides. As we do all these things, keep your eyes on the gospel. Keep your eyes on the gospel. Remember what the gospel tells us, that that we were sinners, we were enemies of God, by nature children of wrath, deserving God's wrath, and instead of pouring out His wrath on us, He gave us His Son. Instead of judgment, He didn't just give us non-judgment. Instead of judgment, He gave us redemption. And He gave His Son to live and die and be raised for us, so that if we repent of our sins and place our faith in Christ, we have forgiveness of sins, eternal life, and we are adopted children of God. One reason it's key to keep our eyes on the gospel is that it will undergird everything that we've been commanded here to do. Think about it. Be angry and do not sin. Oh, but they're so bad. So are you. And God gave his son. Speak, not in a way that tears down. But do you know what they did? But you know what you did? You deserve death and hell work so that you can give. Well, working, I mean, I, I have to do a lot of work. It costs me to do that. Cost his son for our redemption. He did not spare him, but gave him for us all. What about the kindness and tenderness? Again, well, they're not deserving, neither are you. Right, The gospel undergirds everything we do. We really do get to be, as Paul says, imitators of God to one another. So keep your eyes on the gospel. Second, remember how much you're loved by your heavenly Father. Remember how much you're loved by your heavenly Father. Now, I say this because Paul keeps coming back to it. He keeps coming back to it. He's already prayed for them. That they, well, one, remember when he prayed for them? He started out as he prayed that they would be able to comprehend that which surpasses knowledge, the height, the width, the depth, the length, the breadth, the love of Christ. Remember the first thing he said is, you being rooted and grounded in love, in other words, everything you are, you are because of the love of God for you. Why am I an adopted son of God? Because in love, he predestined you to be an adopted son of God. Why am I alive instead of dead in my sins? Because when you were dead in your sins, God, because of the rich love with which he loved us, made us alive together in Christ. And so Paul says, rooted and grounded in love, that's who you are. Everybody who you are is rooted and grounded in the love of God. And then he says, now I pray that you'll be able to know it, that you'll be able to comprehend it, that you'll be overwhelmed by God's love for you. He's just been hammering and hammering and hammering, and now he comes back to it again. It's a bit subtle, but it's here. Look at chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. Who are you? You are a loved child of God. And then listen to what he says in verse 2. And walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. It is very important to Paul that the Ephesian believers understand that they are loved by God. Why? This is at least one reason, I think, why. If you and I will ever grasp how deeply we are loved by God, it will free us to love others. If you don't get that, If you always see God as someone you're having to wrestle approval from, wrestle his love from him, then you're always going to feel like you're measuring up and you're struggling to measure up, you're struggling to achieve, you're struggling to get his approval. And if you live your life with that mindset, feeling that struggle, the only relief you feel like you have is to be able to compare yourself with others and put them down. I'm trying to get God's love. I can't do enough, but at least I'm better than Linda. Or, did you hear what she did? 
Why do we do that? Because it makes us feel better. Why? Because we feel this need to be better. But what if we say, I am loved by God? I have the most security anyone could ever have. The creator of the universe loves me. And his son gave himself for me because he loves me. And then he poured out his love for me in my heart through the Holy Spirit so that I might know I'm loved by him. Now, if I'm loved by God, I don't need from you. I don't don't have to take from you. I don't have to compete with you and put you down. Now I'm free just to lavish love on you. I think this is one of the reasons Paul ends the text that way. The only way we'll be able to love one another is if we first realize God has loved us. But then the love God has for us can overflow from us toward one another, which then brings us just hand in hand with that point to just a third observation. It's one I ended with last week. I want to end with again this week. Paul doesn't give us these commands so that we might do them and measure up and be approved by God. The only thing that allows us to be approved of by God is the work of Jesus Christ for us. He lived and died and was raised so that my sins might be forgiven and so that his righteousness might be credited to me. You and I get to start every day of our lives, if our faith is in Christ, as those who are approved of by God. And as those who are approved of by God and are overwhelmed with that good news, let's obey these commands. Let's just do these things so that as a body, instead of tearing down one another, instead of being destructive to one another, we can grow together in love. So the way we're going to end our service then is, is very fitting, and it's because we didn't come up with it, Jesus did. The way we're going to end our service is by reminding ourselves of how God has loved us. Christ loved us and gave himself for us. We're going to remind ourselves that, that we're secure in him. His love is for us, and it is everlasting. But it's also going to be a public declaration of us as we come to the front and we take the bread and we take the cup and we return to our seats and then together we eat and drink of it. When we eat and drink this morning, we're not only remembering what God has done for us and our security and the love of God for us, we're also making a proclamation this morning as we eat and drink. We have heard Christ's commands and by faith, by His grace, we're choosing to obey them. So let this be a day in the life of Cornerstone Community Church in which we say together, we want to obey these commands so that we might be a body who is built up in love. If you're not a believer this morning, I want to plead with you this morning to place your faith in Jesus Christ. This morning, as much as we've talked about the love of God for us, if you do not repent of your sins, and place your faith in Jesus Christ who lived, who died, who was raised, and who reigns and is coming back to judge the living and the dead, if you don't repent of your sins and place your faith in Jesus Christ, you will face his, and hear this, merciless wrath. It's a horrendous thought. But he makes it very clear. And as much as we might be ashamed and sheepish to talk that way, the Bible isn't. The Bible doesn't pull any punches. On the day of judgment, all those who have not trusted in Jesus Christ will be cast into a lake of fire where they will have no rest day and night forever and ever. So if you're not a believer this morning, I want to plead with you to place your faith in Christ. Trust in the one who lived and died and was raised. If you'd like to talk to me, you'd like to talk to your neighbor, you'd like to talk to a pastor, you can talk to me after the service. I'll be right here. I'm, I'm tall and thin, right? You can see me. Wherever I go, just track me down, talk to your neighbor. Oftentimes, in fact, we'll have it. We have that, I think, every Sunday. At least a couple of our pastors wander out to that lobby. If you want to stop them and say, I want to know Christ, they would love to talk to you. If you're not a believer this morning, I want to plead with you to trust in Christ. If you are a believer, you're in good standing with a gospel-preaching church, and you professed your faith in Christ and baptism, we want to ask you, to join with us this morning, to to make this proclamation with us this morning that our hope is in what Christ has done for us, and by faith, we will obey what Christ has commanded us to do. So let's take a moment of silence this morning before we come forward. Uh, The musicians will get in place during that time, and then as we come forward, there'll be a pastor on either side and a pastor over there. You'll come and take one stack of two cups, and then just return to your seat. Once you're back in your seat, we'll all eat and drink together. So let's take a moment of silence as we prepare to come to the table.
this morning.